And we continue now with uh, Dr. Gary Ostrower, the longtime Alfred uh, University history professor. Dr. Ostrower, uh, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me once again. Well, Dr. Gary Ostrower, the uh, Trump press conference last night, uh, those go on pretty long. Uh, when you think of the uh, traditional uh, White House press conferences, usually they're at noon, and usually they go uh I don't know, half hour, an hour, or something like that, 45 minutes, but wow. Uh, last night's press conference, I guess you, you could use the word spectacular uh, for a number of reasons. Your thoughts, Dr. Ostrar? Well, I wouldn't use the word spectacular. I'd use the word appalling. These really aren't press conferences. Uh, they are in one level, but what Trump is really doing is providing a kind of information, uh, an infomercial uh, for his own presidency. Uh, and he, he takes over the conference, and it's not only as if you know he's the one person there who's going to respond to the questions from reporters, but he is surrounded by a few people, some of whom really are experts in the area of infectious disease, in the area of the COVID-19 uh, virus itself, and so forth. He's, uh, uh, you know, he's there. Uh, surrounding himself with these people as if they are going to provide some respectability to what he is saying. But he uses them, uh, he uses them, uh, you know, as instruments. He uses them as, uh, as uh, devices, so to speak, in order to prop up his own presidency. And I thought that yesterday's conference was especially interesting, if only because he begins the first half an hour of the conference attacking the media. He doesn't talk about uh, the people who have died. He did not offer one shred over everything that I saw. I didn't see the entire conference. I suspect not very many people saw the entire conference. But I did see sections of it uh, on different TV programs afterwards. And what I saw is the president not offering a single iota of sympathy to the people who have, to the families who have lost their loved ones. We're now talking about, you know, thousands upon thousands of people who have died in the United States. And remember, Brian, that this is a man who said, uh, you know, as you know, certainly in uh, uh, you know about a month or so ago, that uh, the uh, uh, the we have this under control. Uh, he said we have 15 cases. I think this is on the 16th of March. Uh, that we have 16, 15 cases, and we expect it to go down to about zero. Uh, he minimized. He dithered. He minimized this whole thing for weeks and weeks and weeks and this is after he had been plenty warned by members of his own administration including his chief trade representative peter navarro that and you know, way back in early january that this thing could get very very bad and when i say very bad i mean in the neighborhood of hundreds of thousands of potential deaths here in this country not only of course in respect to worldwide numbers so he minimized all of this and now at when that minimization is called to attention. The New York Times did a front page uh, article, the main article, uh, just two days ago on Sunday, uh, in which they accounted for many of his statements. These are you know, words coming out of his own mouth or else words that were placed onto his Twitter feed. I think that's what the purpose of the video last night that Trump showed uh, at the beginning of the press conference was, to contradict what the uh, New York Times said. And there was uh, a quote in there from uh, Maggie Haberman of the Times uh, contradicting uh, the story. So, uh, d d now, did you see the video, Gary? Uh, I did not see the video, but if I can just comment on that, Maggie Hagerman. Sure. Uh, Haberman. There were six reporters, really, really good reporters, including David Sanger, who I think is one of the top reporters in this country. There were six reporters who provided that article that appeared in the Times on Sunday. Uh, the only one of the six who he attacked by name, the only one was Maggie Haberman, and she was the only female among those six, just as he often attacks uh, other female reporters, even at his press conferences. You know, there's something disordered going on here, and I I think that, you know, it's time for us to say perhaps that the emperor has no clothes, that this is a man who is, uh, uh, who has, you know, kind of lost the sense of balance, has lost the sense of, uh, of, of, of constitutional principles, you know, having to do with freedom of the press. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think 
people are going to remember from yesterday's press conferences uh, is that, you know, he said, uh, you know, the president's powers are the president's powers. Well, I'm not really sure, Brian, what that means. But he then went on to say that the president's powers are total, that the president's powers are total. It was a total authority, and that came up when they were asking him, um, I believe it was a question about were the uh, governors going to open the economies back up or was uh, President Trump going to uh, open that back up again. And I, I, my takeaway from that is if Trump had not gotten into that uh, back and forth about who has the constitutional rights to open the economies, the presidents or the governors, my takeaway is if, if, if he had not gotten into that, the big story from last night would have been the video that was shown. Well, that may be, but he did get into it. And Paula Reed from CBS then asked him specifically, as did another reporter who I didn't recognize, on what basis are you saying that, you're to- that your power is total? On what basis? What is the constitutional basis for your, uh, uh, for, for your statement? And his response was, uh, 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 you know, it's in the Constitution. And then she followed up. What, what part of the Constitution, what specifically are you referring to? And he didn't give an answer. And he didn't provide an answer because he can't provide an answer. What the president is saying is that, uh, you know, we don't have a checks and balance system here. He's arguing that, you know, as he said, in a way, during his uh, campaign, you know, uh, only I can fix it. At one point, he calls himself the chosen one. He's essentially arguing that uh, he has total power, that the president, and he said this once before, the president can do anything that he wants. Well, folks, if you read the Constitution, uh, you're going to discover that the president can't do anything that he wants. Uh, a historian recently said that uh, if Churchill were here, he would, to hear that s- statement, Winston Churchill would think that the British had won the American Revolution. Uh, you know, King George wanted, uh, you know, total power. And the Americans were fighting in order to limit the king's power. We didn't want a king. We wanted a, a, a constitutional system of limited government. And Trump simply does not understand that. And I think that conservatives who are uh, who claim who claim uh, to be you know protecting constitutional principles better understand the threat that's involved in the way in which this president views his own authority. And if he wins a second term, there are going to be no restraints whatsoever on the way in which he's going to abuse that authority. Do you think that he really meant that he was going to um, uh, get into it with the governors and force a takeover? It seemed that what he was saying, Dr. Ostrauer, was that uh, I, I could impose uh, authority and force the governors to do that, but I don't want to. He seemed to repeat that two or three times. Look, if he says he has that authority, then he believes that he has that authority. And the fact is that he does not have that authority. Can you imagine if Barack Obama had said those same words, that I have that authority, that I have uh, you know, total authority? Uh, conservatives in this country would have been going into orbit and they should be going into orbit right now. We have, this is a threat to our constitutional system. You know, the, his power is not total. He says he can't fix everything. We do have a system in which power is shared between and among three branches of government, not only, you know, not, not just one. Uh, and uh, I, you know, as I said a moment ago, I fear that if he wins the second term, there will no, especially if he has a Republican Congress with him, there will be no limits on what he is uh, what he's going to do with the the sense of limited government of you know that that even the president is subject to the law i think that is going to uh, i think that will disappear uh but, you know, there are obviously a lot of people who don't, uh, you know, they listen to Fox, uh, you know, Hannity, and they listen to Limbaugh and whatnot. And these people, it's a, it's a presidential defense network. They're not being very critical of the president. And yet the press has an obligation to be critical if the press is going to be doing what, 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 what it's supposed to do. Uh, uh, th- there's a, a really good historian that most of you probably have not heard of. His name is Tom Nichols. He's a rather conservative guy, very conservative guy. Uh, he is a historian at the Naval War College uh, in Connecticut. Uh, and 
you know, he makes the point that, and I'm going to read something that he says. He says that the president is characterized by a kind of spiritual poverty. He diminishes us. It's like he's like an overdrawn checking account that keeps imposing new penalties on a customer already in difficult straits, draining the last reserves of decency among us. In other words, you know, what the president is doing, what Nichols is saying, is that his press conference is filled with vile. It's filled with, if you will, hatred. It's an attack mechanism for him to go after anyone. And that, of course, includes uh, the New York Times. It includes uh, uh, you know, NBC. It includes CBS. It includes anyone who criticizes him. And if you do criticize him from within the administration, you're gone. That's why, you know, uh, General McMaster is no longer there. That's why General Mattis is no longer there. That's why you know uh, General Kelly, uh, you know, is gone. Rex Tillerson is gone. You know, there's either you tow his line or else, uh, or, or and he wants to hear nothing. He wants to hear nothing that would in any way contradict his own version of reality. I think you know we're in trouble. I think one of the things we see with uh, the Dr. Fauci situation, uh, and, and this uh, touches on what you were talking about there, on uh, those who disagree with the president uh, find themselves uh, looking for another job. Uh, Trump yesterday retweeted a, um, uh, a tweet that said, fire Fauci. And Trump put that uh, a tweet uh, out again on Twitter, uh, making it much more famous than it originally was, the tweet. And I think what we see with President Trump is uh, when he dislikes someone or, or gets mad at someone but then makes up with them, um, Trump then comes on and we were always friends and this person is great. He said this about uh, uh, numerous foreign leaders that he's argued with and then they make up and then all of a sudden they're great friends and always have been. Uh, the way that uh, Trump tells it. Uh, now, it was obvious to the press that uh, that was the case yesterday, and they asked a bunch of questions about uh, Fauci, and uh, Fauci spoke for a bit. Did you catch that, Dr. Ostrar? A little bit, and what I saw Fauci doing was, in a sense, retreating from what he had earlier said. What Fauci had earlier said was that if we had, if the president had really led back in January, if he had, uh, uh, you know, kicked up, after he had been warned by numerous people, uh, 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 you know, the production of uh, face masks and of other, uh, uh, you know, protective gear, uh, and more importantly even, uh, of testing, of the swabs and so forth that we need for testing. If we had done that, we could have saved many, many lives, you know, thousands upon thousands of lives. Well, the president viewed that as a criticism, and in a way it was a criticism. Now Fauci was in a position either of getting himself fired or walking back. So he said, well, I was speaking hypothetically. In a way, it was hypothetical because, I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, the major effect of COVID-19 had not yet arrived here. But the fact of the matter is that, yeah, he had a retreat, and he had a retreat in order to maintain whatever kind of influence he's going to have. Because I think that Fauci, who is an incredibly admirable character and a very, very good scientist, I think that, you know, Fauci is one of the few people who has been able to restrain the president even somewhat in respect to uh, the way in which he wants, the president wants to open up the country again. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with Dr. Offshore in uh, just a moment. Stay with us. The award-winning service department at Maple City Dodge is open. They're ready to pick up, sanitize, and return your vehicle after the work's done. The sales department is also available. Gary, Larry, Aaron, John, and Doug are working from home and making great deals, including 0% financing for 84 months and 90 days no payment on select 2019 and 2020 vehicles. Some restrictions apply. Contact Maple City Dodge to get in touch with your favorite sales guy maple city dodge in hornell proud to be serving you checking in now with meteorologist rob carolyn brian this morning we are looking at some cloudiness off to our east but skies generally west of the binghamton area all the way out to sandusky ohio are partly to mostly clear right now looks like a decent day we're kind of behind the storm system that pummeled the northeast yesterday we saw parts of new york state gusting over 60 miles an hour yesterday saw gusts in new england over 70 miles an hour it'll be breezy today but nothing like that looks to be partly sunny highs will be up to about 45 to 50 this afternoon 
Sunrise was at 629. It'll set tonight at 752. Tonight we have a very weak disturbance headed our way. It'll produce some clouds, may even produce a light rain or snow shower overnight. It's going to be chilly, 25 to 30. Tomorrow we'll have clouds. It'll be breezy, a leftover rain or snow shower possible, mainly tomorrow morning, highs 45 to 50. Partial clearing, 25 to 30 tomorrow night. Thursday, not bad. A mixture of clouds and sun, breezy and cool, highs 40 to 45. And then, Brian, it looks like another round of rain heads our way for the day on Friday. Back with uh, Dr. Gary Ostrar. Uh, Dr. Ostrar, we could go on for hours about uh, last night's press conference, which lasted, what was it, two hours, I think? But uh, I wanted to get to this day in history at some point. Are you ready to move on, Gary? Uh, I wanted to say something about what happened in Wisconsin over the last week, where they had an election, a primary election. Sure. And, uh, you know, on the Democratic side, I suppose it really doesn't make much difference anymore because, you know, Bernie Sanders has pulled out of the race. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the primary, uh, the uh, you know Biden got about two thirds of the vote, and uh, Bernie Sanders got about one third of the vote. But more importantly, was ha- what happened in a, uh, a a judicial election, a popular election for a member of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And this may appear as if it's a very kind of local issue that doesn't have much to do with anything, except it has a lot to do with something. And what it has a lot to do with, I think, is two things. Number one. The Republican who lost the election was the incumbent. He was the guy who was already on the Supreme Court. He was expected to win the election. And Wisconsin has been very evenly balanced, the Supreme Court there, uh, on a three-to-three basis, three people who support a measure that would prevent the uh, use of mail-in ballots and so forth, and three of them who support the use of these uh, mail-in ballots. Uh, The Democrats support the use of the mail-in ballots. The Republicans are trying to restrict the number of people who can vote, which I also think is a subject we might discuss on this program someday, because during most of American history, we have expanded democratic rights, and now we're in a position where we begin to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to restrict them. But in any case, you've got a three-to-three vote on the Supreme Court. This Republican was supposed to win the, it was expected at least, to win the election. Uh, and of course, this occurred during the COVID crisis. There was an issue as to whether or not people could either vote, uh, you know, even in, uh, you know, mail and absentee ballots on this particular election. And the courts, including the Supreme Court of the United States, eventually said no, they could not. So yeah, the Republican was expected to win easily. He didn't win the election. He lost, and he lost by a decisive margin. Uh, and, uh, you know, many people were unable to vote. For instance, in Milwaukee, where they have about 160 voting places, only five, only five were open for the election. I think that the president should be plenty concerned about this, because in many ways, I think what happened in Wisconsin was a kind of referendum on President Trump, not only on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And so we're going to have to watch, I think, this rather carefully. I think it's important for another reason. And that is that if the, uh, uh, if the Republican had won, about 200,000 people in Wisconsin who might otherwise cast ballots in November will not be, would not have been permitted to do so. Well, that 200,000 may make a big difference in a state that, was, that, that the president won back in 2016 by only 23,000 ballots. And Wisconsin's a key state. Wisconsin is one of those key states that may tip a presidential election one way or the other. So, you know, what I'm saying is it's not simply a local issue up in Wisconsin. Keep your eye on that. Well, Dr. Ostrar, on this day in history, April 13th, as I'm sure you know, uh, being the historian that you are, the Lincoln assassination. Um, every, everyone pretty much knows that Lincoln was uh, shot watching a play. It was at the uh, Ford Theater. And um, the uh, suspect in the case, um, John Wilkes Booth, was shot in a burning barn. Now, did they just decide, you know, to execute him on the spot, or was there a shootout between John Wilkes Booth and, uh, what's the guy's name, Uh, Boston Corbett? Well, let, let me go back just a tiny bit. Sure. The, 
the the assassination was not simply one of Booth versus uh, uh, versus Lincoln. Uh, it was a plot. Uh, they were plotting ever since the beginning of the year. The beginning of the year meaning 1865. Uh, there was an attempt, as a matter of fact, or at least there was uh, a plot to kidnap Lincoln uh, in uh, in March of 1865, uh, and that never came off. I don't remember why, but I believe it was it didn't come off because Lincoln did not show up in an area of Richmond that he had been expected to visit. And so they, you know, kind of postponed things. So the plot finally materialized in April. It was April 14th uh, that Lincoln was shot. And, but it was not simply Lincoln. Uh, there was an expectation that they would kill the vice president, uh, Andrew Johnson. Uh, the fellow who was going to kill Johnson kind of uh, got cold feet, so he simply never went through with it. Uh, but another assassin did attempt to kill uh, William Seward, a New Yorker uh, from Auburn, New York, who was the Secretary of State. And remember, at that time, if the uh, president, uh, if the president died, and if the vice president died, then the Secretary of State would have been, you know, one of those in line to become the next president, the uh, pro- president pro tem of the Senate, uh, of the then the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, and then of course uh, the Secretary of State. Uh, Seward was very, very seriously injured. Uh, but in either case, yeah, Lincoln was Lincoln was assassinated. Booth, who had spent the the war years in the North, not in the South, was nevertheless a Southern sympathizer, a Confederate sympathizer. He escaped. Uh, he made his way with broke with a broken leg uh, to a barn in Virginia, northern Virginia, and that's where federal troops caught up with him about two weeks after the assassination. One of his Confederates left, one of his associates left the barn, surrendered, but Booth did not. The, fed, the, uh, fed, the federal troops said that they would burn the barn if he didn't leave, and uh, he remained in the barn. Uh, was he shooting at the federal troops? I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but, uh, you know, they killed him before the, uh, before the barn finally uh, was com- kind of completely consumed by fire. Uh, he was a, uh, you know, as they say, a Confederate sympathizer. Uh, he was un, uh, un, uh, unreconstructed in terms of uh, his racism and whatnot. And it was one of the sad moments in American history. Lincoln was taken from the Ford Theater, where he had been shot, to a house right across the street, to an apartment right across the street. And the following morning, around 7 a.m., he died. With that, we have to leave it. Uh, always great having Dr. Gary Ostrar on. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much for having me, Brian.